Bom dia. That's about the only thing I'll say in Portuguese. <laughs> Dr. Vassman, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank the program committee for the invitation to come to Brazil. This is my second time in Brazil. First time was on a family holiday in the summer of 2015, and I must say, my two sons said, Brazil, the country's beautiful, the people are beautiful, and they're great hosts. So it's really a pleasure to be here a second time. I have seen Dr. Saipo's work with the mouse, so I'm gonna just ask for the next slide. I'm gonna talk about uh, surveillance of occult or small papillary thyroid cancer uh, and the ethical responsibilities. And I just have a PET scan showing an incidentaloma. This is why we're dealing with this issue. And also histology slides, because some of these are diagnosed a significant number on pathology. So we don't really have the option of active surveillance in these patients. Next slide, please. Next slide. I have no conflicts to disclose because I'm a civil servant in the US. But more importantly, although Dr. Weissman gave the nice introduction of me, I do have to tell you that I'm a surgeon, so I'm obviously biased and concerned about this talk about active surveillance. All right. This is what I'm going to talk about, uh, just uh, briefly about the epidemiology of thyroid cancer, specifically small papillary thyroid cancer. You've already heard it in two talks, so I'm really going to focus on why it's important if you're entertaining active surveillance and why there is a big buzz about active surveillance for papillary thyroid cancer. When we talk about active surveillance, we principally talk about papillary microcarcinoma. So I'm going to share with you the data on the outcome of patients that were treated. That's very important for us to understand. And then lastly, I'll finish off going over the advantages and disadvantages of surveillance or intervention. Well, I know many of you know the different types of thyroid cancer. A follicular cell origin is what we're talking about here, principally differentiated thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer, which is really the most common type. But what's really important is besides this histologic classification, the natural history of these different histologic types of even papillary thyroid cancer, the follicular variant. Uh, the more aggressive entities, sclerosing variants, have a really different natural history and outcome. And I think it's really important for us to remember that. What about the epidemiology of thyroid cancer? Well, overall, at least in the US, the rates of thyroid cancer have actually decreased. About two thirds of those patients are expected to die of their thyroid cancer at five years follow up. When you look at the data that you've already heard, well, the rate of thyroid cancer is increasing. People speak about the rate of mortality rate decreasing, but I think it's really important for us to remember the overall number of patients that have thyroid cancer and that die from thyroid cancer has not changed in the last three decades. So it's really an excellent prognosis these patients have, about 98% at five years. So I think still think it's important to talk about active surveillance You've already seen this data, actually better data and better presented earlier about how this increase in thyroid cancer incidence is worldwide. But I do have a figure there that shows you in red are the countries or continents with the highest rates of thyroid cancer and the increased incidence. The increased incidence in papillary microcarcinoma is really a problem of the developed world. It's not a problem in Africa, it's not a problem in Asia. So it's really a problem of the privileged, and I think we need to consider uh, cost-effective measures for management of this disease. So uh, Davis and Welch already demonstrated over 10 years ago that indeed we're picking up smaller uh, thyroid cancers, and this accounts for the overwhelming increase in incidence. When you look at it, 80% of papillary thyroid cancers are less than two centimeters. So of course, we're wondering, is this overdiagnosis? Amy Chen did a follow-up study about three years after that initial publication, the state of you already heard, demonstrating that the increase is most dramatic in females. The mortality rate appears to be stable. 
When you look at the age of the patients, those that are 45 and older tend to have a higher increase in incidence. So this is important to keep in mind because the outcome of patients that are 45 and older is much different. She suggests that this is in case a combination of both increased overdiagnosis and also increase in disease burden. When you look at tumors that are four centimeter, the increase is not as dramatic, but there has been a significant increase. So we can account for environmental factors globally, other than the Chernobyl disaster in Russia, and then more recently with the tsunami, the Fukushima disaster, which has not, at least in screening, been associated with the increased in thyroid cancer incidence in children, as was seen with the Chernobyl. So we really don't know globally what the environmental factors are. I think it's really perhaps mostly over diagnosis. You heard this data already in the first talk, but I do want to present our data that we did over a 15 year period of patients, uh, 228 patients treated at our institution. We did somatic mutation profiling, and what you see is in the latter five years in group three, the rate of BRAF mutation was significantly higher Yuri Nikiforov and a group at Pittsburgh did a similar study two years later, and they reported the rate of RAS mutations is higher. I think this is important. When you look at countries where the rate or the incidence of thyroid cancer is high, as you heard in South Korea, they principally report BRAF mutation rates of 80 to 90 percent. So perhaps there's something in the environment that we are not aware of that leads to a higher rate of somatic mutation. Clearly a question that needs to be answered in the future that we do not know the reason for. Okay, so small uh, papillary thyroid cancer is referring to stage one papillary thyroid cancer, and up there I have a near 100% life expectancy. And this brings up the question of why are we treating these patients? I'm gonna focus my talk on when I speak about active surveillance of tumors that are microcarcinoma, one centimeter of less. Some people have suggested perhaps you could watch uh, patients with papillary thyroid cancer that are less than two centimeters. So I'm a surgeon, I told you that in my disclosure slide. My colleague, Dr. Nilabul at the NCI, we were concerned about you know, this application of active surveillance to patients and perhaps providers that are not familiar with thyroid cancer in the US. I don't know what the data is in Brazil, but 80% of thyroid operations are done by low volume surgeons. And many of the patients in the community that are worked up with a thyroid nodule are seen by internal medicine doctors. So I think this is an important question to address. When you think about a new intervention, the outcome of the patient, if it's a patient with cancer, you should not compromise on the overall mortality of that intervention. We're not likely to have that data for patients with thyroid cancer because the rate of mortality is so low. So what NARIS did was look at the SEER data. It's a cancer registry data in the US. It had uh, over 60,000 patients with non-medullary thyroid cancer. And in the pie chart you see what histologic type of thyroid cancer patients died from. This is 1,753 patients that died out of the 60 plus thousand. What was surprising to us is nearly over one fourth of the patients died of papillary thyroid cancer. And two thirds were this in patients with tumors, primary tumors less than two centimeter, one third had papillary microcarcinoma. Of course, we publish this, and there's a letter to the journal by none other than Ian Hay, and John Morris was a co-author, saying most patients with papillary thyroid cancer you could observe or do ablative treatments. The problem is we don't have that data, so I, I don't know what the right answer is. I think that we need to consider that these patients do have adverse outcomes and do account for patients that die from thyroid cancer. And the analysis was pretty much consistent with the incidence data that you've uh, heard here, where the most increase in incidence was due to small 
uh, papillary thyroid cancer and papillary microcarcinoma. And this is the data showing the rate of mortality due to small papillary thyroid cancer and the impact of the time period that the patient was diagnosed. Patients diagnosed in the later time period on multivariate analysis, although a very small difference in survival, there is a statistically different uh, overall survival. All right, we need to know who's gonna die of thyroid cancer if we're gonna think about active surveillance. And this is one of the important things we found in that data is those patients that had papillary microcarcinoma that died of thyroid cancer were older than 45. And when you look at ethnicity, although it wasn't significant on multivariate analysis, they were African Americans. And when you look at the data in aggregate in the US, most of the mortality, this is consistent with the staging system for thyroid cancer, is due to patients older than 45. So I'd propose to you perhaps active surveillance is not the appropriate approach for those individuals. All right, to summarize what I went over, the epidemiology of thyroid cancer, which I think is specifically relevant to papillary microcarcinoma, we know the definition of it is less than a centimeter. Clearly, the incidence has increased. Yes, some of it is due to overdiagnosis, so we really do need to think about active surveillance in these patients. I think it's important to distinguish with what is diagnosed incidentally and pathologically. I'll share with you some outcome data in regards to that in the next section of the talk and what is the outcome of papillary microcarcinoma there's a lot of data on this in fact there's probably 20 to 30 papers published every month when you look on PubMed so what I did was look at a very nice meta-analysis done by Mahana and colleagues that was published in JCNM in 2014 they had over 3,500 uh, patients they looked at papers that specifically specified whether the diagnosis of papillary microcarcinoma was incidental or manifested clinically as you could see the demographic Graphic and the follow-up uh, in between these two groups was not significantly different. As you'd expect, those that were diagnosed incidentally tended to have a smaller tumor as well as a lower rate of multifocal disease and a higher rate of lymph node metastasis or lower rate in the incidental group. What was quite interesting to me to see this data in aggregate of multiple studies is that the rate of overall recurrence was significantly higher in those that were non-incidental. Now, non-incidental is defined as a histologic diagnosis. And when they looked at where these patients had recurrence, uh, it was not only in the thyroid bed, but a significant number of those patients had lymph node recurrences. So the outcome of all patients with micropapillary uh, carcinoma is not near normal life expectancy and some patients get recurrences. And this is patients that had thyroidectomy plus minus radioiodine ablation and maybe thyroid hormone for TSH suppression. So I think the first question we need to answer is, I have uh, what was the US military policy uh, where they said don't ask, don't tell with respect to people's sexual preference. And I think we need to do the same thing when we see a patient with a thyroid nodule. You should not stick a needle in it if you're not prepared to deal with it. What's refreshing about the recent 2015 ATA guideline is they actually don't recommend biopsying thyroid nodules less than one centimeter, even if the ultrasound features are suspicious. So I think in a public health domain or health practice, we need to decide what we're gonna biopsy. Because I think if you biopsy it, there's the patient element of the equation that will really determine if active surveillance is even a viable option. This is not insignificant because if you look at the population, 5% will have thyroid cancer and there's over 500,000 thyroid cancer survivors. So you could anticipate at least in the US, this is about 18 million patients out there with 
papillary mycocarcinoma, and many of you are familiar with autopsy studies, depending on how the pathologist does two micron section, upwards of 34% of the patients might have papillary mycocarcinoma. This is not new, at least in the US. Active surveillance is a really one of the pillars of patient management for patients with prostate cancer because a similar epidemiology was seen for prostate cancer, localized prostate cancer. And similarly, active surveillance is being used for urethral and some smoldering non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So what should we consider if we're going to do active surveillance? I think the principal thing is we do not want to do harm. So we want to be able to select the patients that are going to have low risk disease. It makes sense to consider active surveillance because the mortality is low. And certainly there's a significant amount of resource utilization as you heard from the earlier talk just for thyroid cancer management. Uh, and it's really important for us to understand, though, the short and long-term morbidities and mortality of treatment. I'm a surgeon. I don't have any complications. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of surveillance and intervention? The best data, the only data on active surveillance comes out of Japan. It's uh, really instituted by Akira Miyuchi uh, back in 1993. This is one of their first studies. I have a picture of an ultrasound. The ultrasound is very important, selecting the patients that are appropriate candidates for this. They need to have a solitary thyroid nodule, interthyroidal, with at least two to three millimeter of normal thyroids surrounding that solitary nodule. You should biopsy it if you're gonna elect to undergo active surveillance, because you need to know what you're dealing with. They should have no cervical lymph nodes in the lateral neck. So they did this approach in the first 340 patients, and uh, over 1,000 had immediate surgical intervention. The average follow-up was over six years. And what's interesting is only 6% of the patients had an enlargement of their solitary dominant thyroid nodule of more than three millimeters at five years follow-up, and then up to almost 16% at 10 years follow-up. Very few patients had lymph node metastasis during that five and 10 year follow-up, 1.4% and 3.4%. I do want to emphasize though, this is an outstanding group. In fact, the Kuma Hospital is essentially a thyroid hospital. So one wonders if we're gonna have the same results elsewhere. Well, they've added to this initial study and subsequent follow-up studies, because as I shared with you, I think it's really important for us to know who's gonna have progressive disease. Well, they found patients that were young, less than 40, were more likely to have their dominant thyroid nodule enlarged, as well as node metastasis. In a limited number of women that went on to be pregnant, they found that those patients were at a higher risk to have progression of their primary tumor. So, that's an outstanding group. I already told you I never get complications. Let's look at the outcome between the patients of uh, observation versus surgery. And this is not surprising. All of these patients had papillary microcarcinoma. There were no deaths from thyroid cancer during uh, the follow-up. There were some patients who died of other causes. Um, and in the surveillance group, only 94% less than 10% of the patients because of disease progression or patient preference needed to have a thyroidectomy. Well, some of the people have referred to this as salvage thyroidectomy. So the outcome is quite good, more than a six-year follow-up now with the updated report of almost 10-year median follow-up. This data, I think, is very telling. This is an outstanding surgical group. What they did was compare the patients that had immediate operation, 
with patients with active surveillance. Now, mind you, this is not immediate operation in a different disease process. These are all patients that could have been eligible for active surveillance. It's not surprising that the rate of complication, uh, vocal cord paralysis and hypoparathyroidism transient was much higher in the patients that required an immediate operation. And if you're asking why did patients that were under active surveillance have a complication, because the subset of patients were less than 10% uh, that required a salvage thyroidectomy. So significantly higher with immediate surgery. Although this is somewhat intuitive, meaning if you don't have an operation, you don't have a complication, I think in the hands of this outstanding group, although these rates are low, even the rates of permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve and hypoparathyroidism are not nil. They're not negligible. If you're that one in 100 patient that has permanent hypoparathyroidism, it's 100% for you. So clearly there is some morbidity uh, associated with immediate operation. So. And then the last thing they looked at is the patients requiring thyroid hormone, about two-thirds in those that had an immediate operation because they do hemithyroidectomies. Not everybody required thyroid hormone replacement. And in the active surveillance group, some of the providers had chosen to give the patients thyroid hormone for TSH suppression. So it was significantly more in those that had uh, immediate operation. I have a quote from the group. I think it's an important take-home message, uh, at least uh, in the providers at the Kuma Hospital. They say, patients being followed with active surveillance demonstrate the same risk of local regional spread, distant metastasis, disease-specific mortality as undergoing immediate surgery. None of the patients in the active uh, surveillance in Kuma Hospital develop distant metastasis this is a diet of disease. I think this is an important contribution by this group that has spurred on active surveillance. But in practice, I think many of us have, in some cases, chosen to observe some patients. I know myself, when I see a patient with a stage three lung cancer on an FDG PET found to have papillary thyroid cancer, not microcarcinoma, four centimeter tumor, I tell that patient, your problem is not your thyroid cancer, it's your lung cancer, let's keep an eye on it. Similarly, in patients with melanoma. So I think uh, in the individual patient, we need to decide what's appropriate. The second question becomes, is this data applicable outside of the Kuma Hospital? Well, the group in New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I think, have over now 250 patients that they've elected to do active surveillance in. They have outlined in a nice, uh, really, opinion paper in thyroid the lessons that they've learned from the Kuma Hospital and what they consider to be ideal patients for active surveillance. Obviously, a solitary thyroid nodule, and it has to not be close to the surface or without extrathyroidal invasion and lymph node, no clinical documented lymph node metastasis. I have in red probable. That term is problematic to me. I don't think you should do an active surveillance program without having a tissue diagnosis and not being sure you're dealing with classic conventional papillary thyroid cancer. Patient characteristics, they suggest that older patients, but I'm not an ageist. I think uh, if I was to watch anybody, it'd probably be the younger patient. Uh, obviously, the patient needs to be uh, willing to accept uh, active surveillance, and the patient needs to be compliant with a defined set of follow-up time periods. And then really this should only be done in centers with both medical, surgical, cytopathology, ultrasound expertise to make sure these patients don't have significant progression and require intervention. I'm going to finish up with the ethics. There's not much other than a letter written by Brandon Stack and Peter Angelos. Uh, this is more of a commentary. They raise, uh, I think, an appropriate concern. 
They state that at the present time, this approach is not standard of care in the United States. It should only be considered with full disclosure, selected patients on an IRB. So this is a research clinical protocol basis. Uh, this would be appropriate, but not as a doctor so-and-so says this is a small, less than one centimeter thyroid nodule. Let's just go ahead and observe this. So they talk about a surveillance contract with the patient. And my slide forwarding mechanism is not working, so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and next slide. They list things that are important to share with the patient. Obviously, you need to codify the patient-clinician uh, relationship, uh, at least in the US. Medical legal aspects of this is very important if the patient should have disease progression and an adverse outcome. So you want to document this. Uh, they refer to this as a contract going over the findings, the cytologic result. Again, I think you need a tissue diagnosis. And you need to agree on when you're going to intervene. Some patients, even in the Japanese cohort and studies and their follow-up, some of the patients had opted out of active surveillance. So this should really be clean, uh, clearly explained to the patient as a, an option. And then obviously the long term of time of surveillance. So I'm going to finish up with an anecdote. And why I'm concerned, although I think it's very reasonable to consider active surveillance, but I really think it should be done on a clinical protocol basis because we do not know enough. We have great data from Japan. Does that apply to the US? Does that apply to Brazil? This is a, a woman I uh, had the pleasure of taking care of, 55-year-old woman. Her thyroid nodule was less than one centimeter. They had tried to biopsy it. The cytology was inconclusive. And fortunately for her, she didn't really have any follow-up. And eight years later, develops a level two lymph node, which on biopsy is consi consistent with metastatic uh, papillary thyroid cancer on cytology. So she required a total thyroidectomy, a bilateral central neck node dissection, and a right lateral neck dissection. And as you could see, her histology was tall cell variant of papillary thyroid cancer. So we could have observed this patient, but I think, again, I'm just emphasizing the point of knowing what you're dealing with uh, and then providing the follow-up uh, for these patients. So what do the guidelines say? Uh, the commentary I shared with you said it was not standard of care. Well, the revised 2050 ATA guidelines suggest that surgery should be considered for any thyroid nodule that is malignant on cytology. This is a little bit of a paradox because they say don't biopsy something that's less than one centimeter. But they do suggest that active surveillance would be reasonable in some patients that have very low risk disease, obviously without any extrathyroidal invasion or lymph node involvement, or if the patient has significant comorbidities or their life expectancy is not what you expected. I think for the latter two, this is what I think most providers, at least surgeons, have been doing in practice already. And then uh, lastly, if uh, the patient with concurrent medical or surgical issues need to be addressed prior to thyroid surgery. So I'm going to finish up with some take-home points and some questions. First point is, should we really be referring to the patient with a thyroid nodule that's less than one centimeter? They have an outstanding favorable prognosis, but should we really be calling it a carcinoma? There are so many examples that this is not done in. Colon cancer, we call it carcinoma in situ. Breast cancer, ductal cell in carcinoma in situ, DCIS. Many women are undergoing observation for that. So I think the first thing that needs to be addressed is the terminology if you want the public at large to accept or consider active surveillance. I think it was Juan Reza had suggested that papillary microneoplasia would be a better term for this cancer. And I would agree with that. And I think if active surveillance is going to be a viable option and patients are likely to accept it, I think the terminology needs to be addressed. 
The second thing is, I think it's imperative that you have a diagnosis. Many of the guidelines, or at least I shared with you the ATA guidelines, would suggest you don't biopsy something less than one centimeter. Well, you can't observe something that you don't know what the cytologic diagnosis is. So I think it's really principal important for any active surveillance program that the patient does have a biopsy and you know what you're dealing with. And I think the measures, the Kuma Clinic does, did an outstanding job, is doing an outstanding job telling us perhaps the patients that are candidate for this solitary thyroid nodule with no local regional disease. And I really think you need motivated patients and specialized centers to be the first centers to institute active surveillance program. And clearly, I think uh, there's many molecular markers, but none of them would, uh, at the current time, are helpful to stratify who's likely to have disease progression. So we're stuck with using the age of the patient, uh, perhaps if the patient wants to undergo pregnancy, in determining whether they're candidates for active surveillance or not. Finish up by saying the second Portuguese word I know, obrigado. Uh, and really, this is an area we don't know what the future holds in.